Where there is water, is there life? The answer might be orbiting Saturn. When Galileo trained a telescope on Saturn in 1610, he saw a triple star. He never realized what it meant. 45 years later, with a better telescope, Christian Huygens perceived a broad ring circling the planet, tilted so that it would vanish and reappear when seen from Earth. Saturn, a gas giant with 62 moons. At least two of them might contain life. NASA's Cassini spacecraft has been orbiting Saturn for 11 years. Cassini arrived at the height of Saturn's northern winter, firing a rocket to slow down and be captured by the planet's gravity. After gliding past the rings, Cassini looped around for its first flyby of Saturn's largest moon, Titan, a cloudy deep freeze of a world with an atmosphere of nitrogen, methane rain, and oily seas of hydrocarbons. Cassini released the Huygens probe to land on Titan. It descended through the moon's noxious smog and sent back images of riverbeds carved out of methane slush. The Huygens probe landing on the surface of Titan was remarkable. It was like being in one universe one moment and being in a completely different universe the other, like something changed. And what changed was we had just taken a device of our own making and landed it on a moon in the outer solar system. What fascinates me about Titan is that it is the only world besides the Earth that has a beach. The beach is a place where a liquid comes to contact with land, with the atmosphere in contact. So all three, dirt, liquid, sky. And that could be very important for life. Could there be life on Titan? If so, it would have to be very different than the water-based life we are familiar with. Maybe on Titan, life is based on liquid, and that liquid is not water, but liquid ethanol. And that would be the most amazing discovery I can imagine in our solar system, because if right here in our solar system, we had life in water and life in liquid methane, then we know it's going to be a zoo out there of all sorts of life forms doing all sorts of crazy things. Cassini has returned to Titan again and again using the moon's gravity as a slingshot to fling itself on an ever-changing path around Saturn, a choreographed dance of planet, moon, and spacecraft with scenic stops along the way. The fractured moon Dione, tiny cratered Mimas, two-toned Iapetus, and the fairest of them all, Enceladus, the brightest object in the solar system. Only 300 miles across, this crinkled ball of snow might be our best hope yet for finding life. Enceladus reflects almost all the sunlight that reaches it, which should make it very cold. But there's something happening inside this little moon. Because Enceladus is orbiting Saturn in an ellipse, it's not a perfect circle. And because of that, it's getting stretched and squeezed during the orbit. And that stretching and squeezing, it gets hot after a while. Warm enough, it appears, to maintain an ocean of liquid water beneath the surface. That's an environment where we might expect organisms to live, microorganisms. Maybe an environment that parallels some of the environments we see here on the Earth in the deep ocean. Cassini discovered that geysers of salty water are erupting from its surface squirting from dozens of stretch marks near its south pole. Cassini has flown through these plumes nearly two dozen times. The spacecraft was not designed to look for life, but it recorded the presence of water and organic molecules that could support life. Cassini discovered these plumes and then adapted its instruments to be able to analyze them. And we've learned so much about these plumes from a spacecraft that was not even designed to do this job. It's a wonderful example of serendipity carried through to perfection. Ice particles and water vapor ejected from Enceladus flow into a wide, tenuous band known as the E-ring. The E-ring is a signpost, proof that the geysers of Enceladus were active long before Cassini arrived. Maybe long enough 
for the ocean inside to evolve life. And if there is life inside Enceladus, alien microbes could be hitching a ride into space on the plumes. It's snowing all the time at the South Pole of Enceladus. If there are organisms in the ocean of Enceladus, it's not out of the question. It could be snowing microbes at the South Pole. The reason Enceladus is so exciting is two reasons. One is it's the only place in the solar system other than Earth where all the requirements for life are met. It's got it all. It's the only place it's got it all. And second, there's samples coming out in space in the plume. It's like there's a big sign, free samples, take one. It's just so easy. We don't need a drill, we don't need a penetrator, we just fly right through. If water and time are what it takes to make life, the solar system has had several chances to get lucky. Mars, its oceans and lakes dried up millions of years ago, leaving only polar caps and streaks of wet sand. Jupiter's moon Europa, the smoothest object in the solar system, like Enceladus, its crust of ice conceals a liquid ocean with more water than in all the oceans of Earth. It may also have the necessary organic molecules for life as we know it, but sealed under miles of ice. Discovering life on Europa or Enceladus would be especially exciting to astrobiologists. Because any creatures have been sealed away under the ice, there's a better chance that they evolved independently of us proof of a second genesis. Life on Mars is interesting because it could be related to us. Either it originally came from the Earth or we came from Mars. But by the time you get to icy moons like Enceladus, which are capped with these crusts, the odds of finding life that is genuinely independent of life on the Earth, I think goes up enormously. And that is incredibly interesting. We know from the history of Earth that just casually taking life from one continent to another can have serious repercussions, not all of them good. And when we're going from planet to planet, we have to worry about that as well. If there's life in Enceladus, it might like to grow in Earth's ocean. So we have to be very careful in cleaning the spacecraft that go there and containing any samples that come back. This is called planetary protection and it's something that we have to take very seriously. In 2017, Four centuries after Galileo first saw Saturn's rings, Cassini will swoop down between them and the planet, then disappear forever into Saturn's clouds. Cassini has been such an, an incredible, profound success in what we've done. Cryovolcanism, geysers spewing into space, that was astonishing. I think even as a scientist, you have this picture of the outer solar system as being kind of a quiet, cold, dead place. And suddenly here it's not. Here's this little moon, active, spewing material into space, and Cassini was there at the right time to see it. And that doesn't happen often in science. This is exactly what the words United Nations is supposed to mean. A collection of nations joined in a common cause, and in this case it was to come to explore an alien planetary system that was clear across the other side of the solar system was glorious, it was just glorious. And if we find nothing after all our decades of scratching and sniffing on strange worlds? If, if we search and search and don't find any evidence of life, well, there's two possibilities. One is our searches aren't very good or aren't very thorough, or that indeed life is rarer and harder than we imagine. Either way, I think the answer is search harder. The absence of evidence of a single living thing anywhere could cause astronomers to question their assumptions and their optimism. It could confirm our solitary confinement in this corner of the cosmos, a chance to feel special, or a chance to be crushed by the weight and beauty of our own loneliness.